Some mysteries scientists since ancient to modern times. One such mystery affects nearly all our personal and social lives. Herpes, the evasive invader. Herpes simplex is a viral infection that attacks skin surfaces. It usually occurs as sores on mucous membranes of lips and genitals. The illness is caused by either of two closely related viruses, herpes simplex type 1 or herpes simplex type 2. Both produce similar symptoms, but type 1 generally occurs on lip surfaces, while type 2 occurs predominantly in the genital areas of both males and females. However, type 2 infections can occur on the lips, and genital infections can be caused by type 1 virus. Three other human herpes viruses are in the same family, but cause different infections. One, varicella zoster virus, VZV, is responsible for both chickenpox in children and shingles in adults. Another herpes virus is cytomegalovirus, CMV, which primarily causes disease in newborns and patients with severely depressed immunity. The third, Epstein-Barr, EBV virus, is the most common cause of mononucleosis. Herpes simplex virus 1 and 2 usually enter through contact with infected people. Sexual contact is the primary method of spreading genital herpes. Upward signs of the infection are blister-like sores, alone or in clusters, on skin and mucous membrane surfaces. Herpes, like other viruses, are extremely small, measuring only 8 millionths of an inch in diameter. This fragile virus is unable to survive outside the body for long. It consists of an inner core of DNA, surrounded by a protein capsid. Herpes viruses also have envelopes surrounding the capsids. Infection begins when the virus enters the body and attaches to the surface of a living host cell. The outer covering or envelope of the virus sheds, and the inner core penetrates the cell. The virus DNA core then travels to the nucleus, the control center of the cell, and takes over the cell's normal genetic regulation. The host cell is no longer in control of its own life's processes. The viral DNA forces the cell to produce thousands of exact copies of itself. DNA cores are formed within the nucleus, combined with newly made capsids and envelopes into new whole viruses. These new viruses then migrate to the cell membrane and are released outside the cell. Here are many healthy cells with dark nucleus centers. Normal cell division and movement can be seen. As infection begins, profound changes occur in the cells. Normal cell division decreases. Membranes of neighboring cells fuse, and their nuclei merge to form giant cells. These giant cells, called Zank cells, can be found at the sites of lesions. Microscopic examination of specimens sampled from the lesions can confirm the diagnosis of herpes. Infected cells appear to boil, bubble, and erupt, releasing more viruses to infect other cells. As this process continues, more and more healthy cells are destroyed. The tissue damage creates blister-like sores called vesicles or lesions. These lesions are the visible signs of the battle below the skin surface. This is the prodrome phase. The first symptoms one notices are itching, burning, or tingling sensations around the site of infection. The surface area may be slightly discolored and sensitive to touch. After the prodromal stage, one or more marks may appear. These marks develop into raised, fluid-filled blisters with darkened red base areas. Lesions may fuse together, forming a whitish-gray cluster. During lesion formation, in some cases there is sharp pain within the affected area. Muscle aches, swollen lymph glands, headaches, fever, and a general sickly feeling can also occur. Vesicles gradually break open and ooze watery fluids. 
filled with highly contagious viruses. After several days, the sores begin to dry and crust over. Scabs form, and healing begins. At this time, most symptoms begin to diminish. Underlying skin tissue regenerates until the lesions are healed. Symptoms associated with primary or first-time episodes of genital or oral herpes are usually more severe than those associated with recurrent or repeated episodes. The entire primary episode lasts about three weeks. Recurrent episodes are usually shorter, averaging seven to ten days. To confirm clinical diagnosis, laboratory tests must be made. The most accurate method is performed by placing a specimen of fluid from a lesion into a living cell culture. These cells are then watched for characteristic changes caused by the herpes virus, and a definite diagnosis can be confirmed. A more useful herpes test, although less accurate than cell cultures, is the pap smear. A gentle scraping of the lesion is placed on a microscope slide. If the specimen contains characteristic zinc cells, or cells with many nuclei, a diagnosis of herpes can be fairly certain. The invasive nature of herpes is quite complex. Let's focus on how the body can fight the virus. The body's natural defense system is called the immune response. A sequence of events takes place beneath the skin surface where cells of the immune system interact with a network of blood vessels, tissue, and lymph glands. The body's main defenses are specialized white blood cells and a vast array of chemical components such as antibody, complement, interferon, and lymphokines. Lymphocytes, members of the white blood cell defense, gain the ability to identify foreign herpes invaders on the surface of infected cells. They seek out only virus-infected target cells and destroy them before the virus has a chance to mature. Other lymphocytes, called plasma cells, produce antibodies. Antibodies are a series of protein chemicals that destroy viruses. By way of microphotography, we can see the central plasma cell releasing antibodies that spread and destroy foreign invaders called antigens. Phagocytes are the scavenger cells of the immune response system. They actively wander in search of foreign antigens. Upon finding the antigens, phagocytes engulf the invaders, digest, and destroy them. How do immune cells and chemicals work together to oppose the herpes invaders? Perhaps the best explanation of the defense is through animation. Herpes viruses enter the body through mucous membranes of the skin. They first attach to the cell's outer surface and quickly cause chemical changes within the surface. The viruses then penetrate the cell and migrate to the nucleus where they increase in large numbers. Neighboring cells fuse together as mature viruses are released and the infection spreads. More cells are destroyed and tissue damage occurs. The body must fight back against this increasing invader. The immune response musters its protective army of specialized white blood cells and chemicals to oppose the rapidly growing invading force. The phagocytes in particular, the macrophages can identify the enemy by its foreign markers. They actively eat and destroy viruses as well as infected cells. Macrophages also communicate with other white blood cells. The T cells, who carry messages to nearby lymph nodes. In the lymph nodes, the lymphocytes clone themselves and transform into specialized cells ready to be dispatched to the area of infection. Reinforcements of killer T-cells arrive to aid the phagocytes. They patrol tissues, seeking out virus-infected cells, which they destroy by injecting poisons. Other defensive recruits are B-cells that transform into plasma cells. The plasma cells produce antibodies or chemical missiles that kill viruses. As antibodies attach to the markers of infected cell surfaces, they bind with a series of nine proteins called the complement system. The first component of complement, C1, combines with an antibody. The second, C2, 
combines with C1, and so on until all nine components are bound. The sequence is like assembling an explosive in its detonator. When all the pieces are attached, the charge detonates to explode and kill the cell. Dying infected cells produce a chemical substance called interferon. Interferon strengthens uninfected cells, enabling them to resist entry of the virus. Other chemical messages produced by T cells activate and assist the body's defense troops. All of these substances help to stimulate and intensify the immune response. As the battle grows more intense, there are heavy losses on both sides. In most cases, the body's natural defense overcomes those of the herpes virus and stops the spread of infection. Tissue repairs itself and healing becomes complete. T and B cells now carry a memory of the herpes identity markers. They circulate and patrol all areas of the body, ready to mount an early attack, more efficiently and rapidly than that of the first encounter. However, some herpes viruses can escape the body's immune defense forces. These evasive invaders retreat and hide in certain nerve endings. They get to these hiding places by traveling along nerve fibers to clusters called ganglia. There, they remain in a dormant or latent state. Since these viruses are not actively replicating, they do not damage the nerve tissue. During this hibernation, the nerve tissue shields the virus. Since the viruses do not reproduce, no cell surface markers appear. Thus, the immune system is not provoked. This dormant stage or latency may be indefinite or continue for varying periods of time. A recurrent infection may occur when latent viruses are triggered by emotional stress, sunlight, menses, colds, or fever. When reactivated, viruses travel back to the nerve sheaths to the same location of the prior infection site. The infection, the mutant 